Okay, I think we can get started. So first of all, I'm going to start with the acknowledgement because although I reside on the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal, Namri, and Garigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land in which I'm speaking from right now today. Um, I'd like to pay my respect to their elders and to their, to their history of community and care that they've bestowed upon this country for thousands of years. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to all elders past and present. And finally, pay my respect to any mob First Nations individuals who are here with us today in this webinar. So sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'm Nina Gabor. I am the director of the brand new Circular Economy and Waste Program of the Australia Institute. Um, it's a program that focuses on research solutions and policies for holistic circular systems uh, within Australia. So we're very happy and excited today um, because this is our very first webinar for the Circular Economy Program, um, the first of many, I should say. In addition to other webinars of the Australia Institute, you can visit our website um, to see upcoming webinars and register there as well. So a little bit of etiquette before we begin today's webinar, you know, it's a few guidelines, if you will, just so that everything goes smoothly and splendidly. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our guest speaker. We're very lucky to have Craig Rucastle here with us today. Um, Craig and I will have a conversation for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open the floor to questions from you guys, the audience. Um, so feel free to submit a question and please use the Q&A button on the bottom panel of your screen. It's a little bit perhaps to the left. Um, and then you should be able to also upvote other people's questions so you don't have to repeat the questions. Um, leave comments on their questions as well. And you can also, um, you know, your comments will be moderated by our lovely staff, Lilia, today. Um, who will also curate the questions. And we won't be able to answer all the questions, obviously, but I'll, we'll do our best to answer the ones that align best to today's topic. Now, having said that, please be polite <laughs> with your questions and comments, okay? So keep it civil, keep it sweet, keep it short. Otherwise, we will have to boot you out. We don't like doing that, but we will if we have to. So finally, um, it's important to know that this webinar is being recorded and is going to go up on the Australia Institute TV channel on YouTube later on today. And then we'll finish today's session at 12 o'clock. Now, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Craig Rucastle. He is the presenter and producer of the War on Waste series. Um, War on Waste is an award-winning ethical and environmental city, sorry, series of the ABC. Um, so Craig Rucastle is an Australian writer, comedian, and documentary maker who's best known for his work with The Chaser. And for going through your bins on War on Waste, if you've seen, seen the series, you'll be familiar with that. Um, Craig and a group of university students, now this is how he started, um, a group of university students founded the Chaser newspaper, which led to a number of ABC TV Chaser programs, including the Election Chaser, CNNNN, the Chaser's War on Everything, and Yes We Canberra, um, <laughs> the Hamster Wheel, and the satirical consumer affairs show, The Checkout. Now in 2017, 2018, and 2023, he presented the multi-award winning ABC TV series, War on Waste, which is what we'll be talking about today. In 2020, Craig presented the ABC TV climate documentary series, Fight for Planet A and Big Weather, and how we, sorry, Big Weather, How We Survive It. He was the director of the feature documentary, Big Deal, Is Our Democracy for Sale? Now, on to today's focus. So seven years ago, the ABC's groundbreaking War on Waste series firmly placed the nation's attention on Australia's waste issues and solutions. So it sparked local and national systems change in the country. And this year, the award-winning series returned with a new season, 
highlighting how far Australia has come in the war on food, plastic, and fashion waste. The new season investigated recycling in Australia brought to light new waste topics, challenged the lack of corporate accountability towards their own waste, explored what government can do to curb the waste tide, and also, very importantly, the season provides straightforward solutions to help us all shift the status quo with Australia's waste crisis because it takes a village. Now, so season one aired in 2017, season two aired in 2018, and after five very long years, uh, season the first episode of season three aired on July 25th of this year. So, Craig, since the second- Hello, Nina. Hi. Hi. Good to be here. Does the, the requirement for answers to be short and sweet or get kicked out, is that also for me or is it? Uh, um, we'll give you a little, long and sweary. <laughs> we'll give you a little bit more uh, <laughs> a chance. We'll give you a longer leash. How about that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm so to since, be out before the end. So since the second season in 2018, have we lost momentum in our recycling and waste management in Australia? Where are we at right now in general? I think that, I think that look, one of the reasons we left a bit of a gap, I mean, apart from the fact that we wanted to do a climate kind of series, is that we kind of needed some things to change. There's been some positive changes. There has been a lot more investment in kind of infrastructure in Australia. There's been, when China kind of closed borders to a lot of recycling, it suddenly pushed it back into Australia and we didn't realize, you know, we've been just sending stuff overseas, not really having much care about what happened to it. And so we're in a kind of transitionary period at the moment where we're kind of going, Oh, hang on a second. We've got to try and deal with this bit of waste and can we do it? And what do we have to build and that kind of stuff? So <clears throat> there's been positive steps forward, but there's also in, in some cases there's been negative steps. I mean, fashion's, I think an example of that where consumption and the speeding up of consumption is kind of outpacing the advance advances. So look, uh, it's a story of pros and cons. There's definitely been some definite uh, steps forward. I mean, in terms of food recycling and stuff like that, it's been a lot mm -hmm. of steps forward. So we, 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 we're not, or we're not just going backwards, I'd say. That's good news considering the situations. Let me put it, to mm. put it lightly that happened within that five-year space. Now, I think to kind of, start off properly, I think we should look at what's on everybody's mind, right, which is recycling. And specifically, I want to talk about Red Cycle. Um, so, you know, deservedly, you know, they copped a, a tremendous amount of anger, you know, for stockpiling and failing to, you know, recycle soft plastics as they were supposed to. And, you know, about more than 5 million pieces of soft plastics were being dropped off at supermarkets, you know, around 2019 and, you know, prior to that. And, you know, we know that soft plastics come from fossil fuels. Plastic comes from fossil fuels. So considering all of this, um, in your opinion, you know, do you think that instead of placing so much blame on Red Cycle, not saying they weren't to blame, but instead of placing so much blame on Red Cycle and their unsuccessful business model, should our collective focus and energy, should it have been placed on us maybe perhaps how we neglected to slowly phase out soft plastics from the get-go. Okay, let me do, I'll do that in two stages. I guess let's start with the kind of red cycle side of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the narrative when red cycle fell over was it was just, you know, six mums around a table trying to solve a problem. That's not exactly true. I mean, they were working with very large supermarkets. Not only that, I mean, when you look at the actual system there, APCO, the Australian Packaging Covenant Organization, has the Australasian recycling label. So if you go to your supermarkets nowadays, you see on lots and lots of packaging labels telling you where to take your soft plastics to. And they put things on the soft plastics all around Australia, billions of bits of soft plastics saying, take this to the back to the store. So they basically took the red cycle system and made it an official part of our recycling system in Australia. Mm -hmm. They did that at the same time, though, that they didn't actually, like, it would have taken them two seconds to realize that if everyone took that soft plastic in, there was no way they could process it. Uh, they didn't even look into how much soft plastic was being processed. So <clears throat> it's a really neglectful system on a lot of different levels there. Um, I'm not saying the supermarkets knew exactly what was happening. There was a, a bit of, unfortunately, not everyone knew. And unfortunately, Red Cycle, it would have been a great story if they'd taken people on the journey of what was going wrong. If they'd mm -hmm. said, hey, look, we're losing the capacity to do it. There's no market for this. We need to build that because that's what needs to happen to actually change it. You need 
government needs to be coming in in a more proactive role to actually change that situation <clears throat> and create, helping to create the markets and helping to ensure that that stuff's getting properly recycled. Yeah. As to the second part of the question, should we have just kind of not worried about red cycle and the recycling stuff and just <clears throat> been focused on the phasing out of plastic? I mean, sorry, let me correct you though. Not, not, um, I didn't not not worry about red cycle, yeah. but kind of while red cycle is happening in yeah. the other, on the other side of things, slowly phase out. Absolutely. Well, look, look. I mean, it's interesting the question of phase out though. Phase out is quite interesting because if we talk about phasing out coal and gas, mm -hmm. I would go, yeah, that's absolutely because we have the solutions there. We have renewable energy as the solution, so we can, you know, we're in the middle of a difficult process of phasing it out. Mm -hmm. One of the problems with plastics is I don't think we're even at phase out stage. So right now I think we're at the stage where we need to fundamentally massively reduce how much plastic we're using. We're constantly increasing putting plastic into the market in a lot of cases where it's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. There are cases where plastic has a role, increasing food life and that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, there's a lot of stuff that's there that has very little role. So we yeah. need to re be reducing that. We need to be massively increasing recycling. If we're going to be putting plastic into the market, we have to have a proper system where we can start to get some kind of circularity to it. At the moment, it's predominantly virgin plastic, dig it out of the ground, turn to plastic, use it once or twice, maybe for a couple of minutes, and then uh, landfill it or just as bad, burn it. So we need to be fixing that recycling but when it comes to that question of phasing it out mm -hmm. i literally i spend so much time looking for the solutions where that we go oh we can just get rid of plastic right yeah things like bioplastics which are often put up as solutions are really complex sometimes mm -hmm. they're better sometimes they're worse yeah. if i'm cutting down an enormous forest to plant corn to turn into bioplastics mm -hmm. that i'm going to use for one second and throw out in the same way exactly. it's not an advance in any yeah. way so if not i not to mention if, not to mention pfas and other yeah things. exactly and all this kind of stuff so it's the question of a phase out is different we, we we need a lot more research going into that and there is enormous amount of that done there's an article today about university of queensland looking into have plastics that will break down in the ocean within one month but i've seen these kind of articles now for years and years on end mm. so i no longer get myself so enthusiastic to go hey there'll be no plastic in a few years which is why Yes, we need to focus on what can we do to phase it out. But in the meantime, we really do need to focus on reducing it and and where we need it or where it's going to be part of the system, making it so it's actually recycled. Our current plastic recycling rate in Australia is about 13%, fundamentally okay. not good. Okay. Um, now, there's so much confusion about, you know, what plastics are recyclable, you know, to the point where a lot of people get into the habit of wish cycling, right? If anyone's not familiar with the term of what, what wish cycling means, it's basically when you throw something into the recycling bin, hoping that it can be recycled. And most of the time, or a lot of the time, it probably can't be recycled, right? So that's wish cycling. Um, and of course, you know, councils all have different standards and rules for what can and can't be recycled. You know, um, and to add further to the complexity and the, and, and the confusion, you know, uh, companies like to put pseudo recycling symbols, you know, with a triangle on, on their plastic products, um, with which often don't mean anything to the consumer, you know, or even like in the series when you had Cotties um, have, you know, with a plastic container that could not be recycled, absolutely could not be recycled, but they said it could be recycled anyway, right? Um, so my question is, in, 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 in one of those episodes, you know, you spoke to the Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, about addressing the issue of recycling and labeling and having a single harmonious recycling standard and system. Um, is there one being developed for the country? And if so, how far away are we from having this? But there's a couple of things happening on that front, I guess. Um, there is a lot more talk about product stewardship going on, uh, but that's how much that's actually kind of happening is kind of questionable. So that's that's the, and one of the main reasons that we focused on things like the Cottage example or the example of green uh, green PT bottles, you know, your Sprites and that. And the reason we focused on those is it's, often there's this blame put on us putting ours in the wrong recycling bin or on the councils, you know, and by that point, it's too late. If it yeah. hasn't been designed properly in the beginning to be recycled as part of a whole system that's been created by government and business, it doesn't come down to us. I can't save that at the end. Mm -hmm. So that's why I focus on that. So there is this more talk about product stewardship and, and putting more pressure on the designer stuff. Uh, it's, we tend to take an approach in Australia that tends to be voluntary rather than mandatory. Mm -hmm. Tanya Plibersek has been talking about mandatory rules in some areas, yeah. and I think we really need to go to that because at the moment, voluntary rules predominantly don't necessarily work. Yeah. There's 
also a big study going on about the harmonization of kind of council recycling because one of the things that just drives us nuts on the show is that we're doing a national show right mm. so we want to be able to give people answers and most of the time we can't even do that because it's like every council is different because they've got a different waste provider who do a different mm. thing goes to a different MRF. so you've got to kind of harmonize the system so you can have actually national education systems and then people will be better educated um so yeah look there's some steps forward in that case but it's very slow and not generally mandatory enough is my particular opinion on that yeah it's a shame that a lot of particularly big business they prefer the carrot to the stick you know. They love a bit of carrot. Uh, they yeah, love, they, love, they, they love, love the stick. They love the promises you know, that they're doing something about. I mean, you know, and and this is it. Look, I, I, I'm not behind. There are some companies that are doing the right thing and are yeah. actually trying to find alternatives here. And what I hate about the current system is that it punishes those companies. Yeah, true. It punishes the pe true. people that are doing the right, doing the right thing. Because they are spending more and investing and trying to find solutions and that kind of stuff. And then you go, yeah. okay, well, you're doing that good stuff. So what we'll do is punish you by making sure that your competitors don't have to do anything of the same sort. So it's, yeah. it's a ridiculous approach. Wow. We have to change that system. So how much, let's, let's talk about fashion right? Um, <laughs> so a bit of a plug for myself. I was on the fashion episode with Craig. If you haven't yes. seen it, I recommend watching the three episodes. Of the episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, uh, so here's the inter interesting thing about you, Craig. Um, you have your own personal style, whether you like to acknowledge it or not. You like to say you're not into fashion. And I don't believe anyone should be into fashion. I believe everyone should be into personal style because fashion is wasteful. Personal style is not, right? But you have your own personal style. You know yourself, you express it. So <laughs> my question to you is that, um, you know, with your penchant for rocking the the legendary plaid shirts that you do, um, at what stage of career did you fall madly in love with plaid shirts? And and also for anyone who wants to develop their own signature signature personal style like you, where should they shop? How can they do it? Uh, look, uh, yeah, look, don't ask me for style questions. It was entirely <laughs> an accident because um, when the first War and Waste was being made, I mean, I. There was no, there's no budget for clothes. I'm just wearing my own clothes. Yeah. But most of my clothes are even too bad to wear on television <laughs> because they just got holes in them and stuff. So literally, I just had a few plaid clothes things left over from probably the checkout in my cupboard. So I wore those yeah. just because they were kind of the only thing I could wear on screen. And then the thing I loved about that is that you can get great, really cheap things at op shops. Mm -hmm. Like it's one of those things I reckon. I love op shopping for for these shirts. Uh, you get them so ridiculously cheap. So that's that's the reason it's simply you because know, you, no, know what you know what no fascinates budget, otherwise it's just what it is <laughs> you know what fascinates me about your op shopping how you manage to find the same type of shirts over and over again you know it's very funny it, it's it is funny that's the other funny thing about them is they do all look the same <laughs> and I'm often changed to shirt. Like there's shirts in series one that look exactly the same as my shirt now. I mean, and it's definitely not still the same shirt. But listen, anyway. listen, Craig, but, I've been I've been op shopping pretty much my entire life, right? Hmm. And I rarely find the same thing twice. But I don't know how you manage to do it, but hats off to yeah, you. Yeah, I'm just lucky. <laughs> I mean, the thing about op shop, op, op shopping is great, but it's also interesting because I think op shops can also like <laughs> the only problem and i love them i'm not criticizing op shops it's not their fault mm -hmm. in a sense, but what they sometimes do is create a situation where you say to people you know you dispose a lot of their clothes you throw them out and they go no no no, i don't i just give them to an op shop but of course op shops cannot deal with the amount of clothes that are dumped on them like exactly. so they deal with them. you probably sell about 16 percent in australia they sell some overseas but they can't deal with it. So that kind of perception of, oh, it doesn't matter how many clothes I buy new because yeah. in the end I can get to an op shop and they'll deal with them is unfortunately the kind of wrong incentive overall. It absolutely is because, um, you know, like you said, op shops only sell about 16% of items and globally we're manufacturing about 150 billion garments a year. Uh, you, you know, this is on a planet of only 8 billion people. So it's yeah. not surprising that 87% of the clothes manufactured every year end up in landfill, right? Mm -hmm. If not here, then countries in poor countries in the global South in, yeah. in landfill there. So, yeah. Exactly. It's a nightmare. Um, so yeah, I was re regarding that um, in Australia, you know, we import about 1.42 billion garments a year in Australia, and we're what 26 million people. Um, so two thirds of that ends up in landfill, which is around over 200,000 kilograms 
And all these statistics I just mentioned makes us the second biggest consumer of fashion and textiles in the world per capita, right? Um, so what, in your opinion, would make the biggest difference in eliminating our clothing waste crisis? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, you know, as you know, you and I probably disagree on this. I, I would just deconstruct the entire fashion industry, uh, basically. <laughs> like like the, the problem, in a sense, is that there's an enormous industry in the world that has enormous power and influence and advertising power in that, that essentially... <clears throat> just promotes the churn of clothing you know it's mm -hmm. a change and the fashion has changed and go to something new yeah and that's what the major problem is so you see, if you look at it you know our, our we're increasing so much how many clothes we're making but our utilization how often we wear them is going down and down and down so it's that kind of churn that's the problem and it's it's interesting because when we're doing this show like when we talk to people on the streets you know people were spun out by the idea that over nearly about nearly two thirds of our clothes are now made by pla in pl by plastic, by fossil fuels, you know, nylon, right. polyesters, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. people are spun out by that. <clears throat> but when you say that to people, they, they want it to be, they want the answer to be, it's okay, I buy cotton, or right? it's all right, I buy wool, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not really the answer there because <clears throat> energy use is worse if you buy nylon and polyester and bizarrely enough, third is wool. But water is way worse if you're buying cotton. And emissions-wise, wool is worse than the others as well. So mm -hmm. the story we wanted to... I, bizarrely, hemp is the only thing that seems to be good on all those fronts, but it's 0.1% of the of the global market. So you're going to be struggle to get a lot of hemp clothing out there. Mm -hmm. But so it's not really about going, well, if I just buy the right clothing, it'll solve it. If I buy the one that's made of this or made of that, they've all got their own kind of footprint on the environment. So the real message is about extending the life of those clothes. Yeah. And how do you do that from a kind of policy perspective? It's hard. I mean, you do see in some countries trying to really put in place incentives for repair because often, often nowadays, you know, it costs more to repair a bit of clothing than it does to buy a new thing from, you know, some online brand. So it's, yeah. How do we increase the repair incentives? I mean, things like clothes swaps that you do is a great kind of way of getting that social element back into, you know, reusing clothes and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Overall, I don't know if the, you need a price on emissions from the actual clothing or something that kind of, in a sense, ironically, the clothing becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper has meant the value has gone out of it. And because the value has gone out of it, we just dispose of it. So yeah. it's, it's becoming the single use plastic. It is. Um, so what do you think about taxing the fast fashion companies and ultra fast fashion companies? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you've got to do something to kind of change that market at the moment. It's just super cheap. And, yeah. and again, it's because our system fundamentally doesn't factor in the costs to the environment. The fact is in the cost, you know, it's super cheap to make a piece of clothing out of plastic. Yeah. It's not super and, cheap. And how much, of our, how, much of our clothing, how much of our clothing is made of plastic and what impact does it have on our health and the environment? Well, it's it's over, it's, it's kind of around 60%, just over 60% is made of, and over 50% of our clothing comes from polyester. Now, in terms of health, it's an interesting thing. Like when we did the experiment, the worst part of the show for me personally was yeah. analyzing the plastic microplastics inside me. Yeah. And the thing I was most surprised about at the time, because I thought it would be kind of all from, you know, oh, I don't use water bottles, but I thought it would be from kind of water in your packaging kind of thing. Yeah. But most of the microplastics we found inside me were um, threads, clothing yeah. microplastics. But, and that's the case in a lot of cases. I mean, when you look at the sediment on the bottom of the ocean, that kind of stuff, there's a yeah. lot of microplastics from clothing, that kind of yeah. stuff. So it's entering us, it's entering our system. Now, I, I don't actually want to freak everyone out because we're at a very early stage in terms of the health effects of that. Um and in many ways, that actually freaks me out more. The fact that when scientists, when you're interviewing scientists and they say, look, we really don't know the answer to that yet. You're like, what? You've got to have the answer. But um, there are a lot of concerning suggestions of what may be the impact of that. And it's not necessarily just the plastic, but enormous amount of chemicals that go into making mm. plastic. There might be a problem. There's some studies showing that plastic carries bacteria, for instance, that might cause problems. So it's a question of the current amount of microplastic in me I'm not freaking out, but we're seeing a, an accumulation of it in the environment and that's going to continue unless we actually find some kind of solution. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, 
it's not positive. <laughs> it's not yeah. a positive story. Yeah. Um, so let's move over to food um, as quickly as possible before we go into the audience questions. So in this recent season, you know, we also learned that, you know, Australia sends 7.6 million tons of household and commercial food waste to landfill every year. Um, and with households throwing away on average, $2,500 worth of gro groceries annually, that's per household, okay? Um, now that's one in every five shopping bags that are dumped. So I was really shocked. Personally, I was really shocked to learn that the concept of eating leftovers is foreign to some people. Um, they even think it's gross. Uh, <laughs> um, so how can we shift this mindset and culture um, with, you know, some Australian households who have this mindset to help reduce food waste. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, there are, there are, there are areas of this kind of waste problem where you go, look, I can't fix this. I'm not in charge of manufacturing plastics in Australia. That's mm -hmm. up to government business. Food waste is an interesting one because still a lot of it does come through households and is actually kind of somewhat linked to our behavior. So that's why we laid out the kind of 500 kilograms of food or half a ton of food, which is what the average family of four throws out in a year. So look, the first step is trying to eat it. And that's about buying less in the first place. Mm -hmm. Better. I think the best tip I learned personally in terms of that kind of stuff through the show is the kind of the use it up shelf or a box in your fridge that you put yeah. everything that needs to be used first into that kind that of thing. That was pretty cool. We've been trying that and that, that, that works to a point, but it's also, yeah, it's not, it, it's buying shopping with purpose. It is eating leftovers. I think most people love a leftover, like a leftover. I mean, why not? I mean, leftover pizza, leftover yeah. pasta. I'm not, a, I so mean, there is I, a, yeah. Like, what's it's not better. to love about it? Exactly. It's better flavor in the second day. Absolutely. But in terms of, that's the kind of, I guess that's the household side of it. Then there's the part about the disposal of it. So even, you know, you're just scraps and that kind of stuff in Australia. You can obviously compost it yourself if you're in a place you can do it, or if you're in an apartment, you can use a bakashi, that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. overall, moving to every council having proper food recycling or FOGO is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And that, that can be turned back into compost to go into gardens, or it can be used in creating energy or other things. Like we're going to need to find numerous solutions for that. But the, the fact that we put, food waste into landfill in Australia, which because it breaks down with that oxygen creates methane, very mm. potent greenhouse gas is just one of the dumbest things we do. So it's Absolutely. very frustrating. We, we, we've had some, you know, there are a lot of policies that are chain, make changing that, but we're, we're still quite slow at the moment. Okay. So it was suggested in the series that farmers should receive tax incentives for donating food that they're unable to sell to supermarkets, you know, mainly, and that's mainly because of, you know, cosmetic standards set by the supermarkets and, and other similar reasons, right? So given that the supermarkets are the ones setting these cosmetic standards and sell by dates, which lead to excessive food waste, should they be taxed for food waste? And if, if, if your answer is yes, should there be measures in place to ensure that they don't pass the tax burden, i.e. the cost, onto consumers? Because we know that they will. Well, it's interesting that, I mean, it's interesting the presumption that if you had a system where, if you had a system where, and there was, there was, a, there was some attempts for this in the UK, if you had a system where the supermarket had to buy all of the crop, mm -hmm. had to sell all of it so it had to either kind of sell it or if it was you know unusable turn into banana bread or something else was sent another thing yeah i don't know if it necessarily would increase the cost because you got to remember that all, all of that waste on farms is actually a cost it's more land it's more water it's more energy yeah and so a lot of, there's a lot of kind of cost involved in that at the moment so it's, it's quite a change i mean as to the second part of the question can you find a way that the tax burden is not passed on to consumers? I don't think we've ever found a way yet, but the Australian Institute can maybe look into that. Uh, but in terms of that, that interplay that goes on about cosmetic standards, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a complex one. It really mm -hmm. is. Supermarkets would say to me, look, this is what consumers want. Yeah. And I don't deny that they would have right now feedback that oh, what consumers take is a certain type of, know behind that but you don't necessarily have a choice to do otherwise you do in some cases where they have seconds things yeah overall you don't really have a choice yeah but that's because we've been trained over years and years and years to go exactly. to think that's the best yeah it would take a kind of untraining it would take a kind I'm of dialogue supermarkets yeah. and consumers over years to go hey this is the kind of waste that happens if we don't put these ones here 
why not get these and we'll have, you know, it, it takes that kind of proactive approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. And supermarkets, look, they are, they are, they are kind of torn between two types of consumers at the moment. There's, there's consumers who are looking for the sustainable and environmentally friendly approach. And yeah. then there's another part of the consumers who just want the most convenient thing. They want a rock melon that's been cut into tiny pieces and every single piece has been wrapped in 12 layers of plastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know like it's, plastic it's, flavor it's, rock melon and that's it's where in a sense you kind of do need some regulation to come in and kind of restrict that to make it so that a supermarket because supermarkets actually it, it's interesting when years ago when i was talking to supermarkets about plastic bag bans they were like we don't mind them but the government's got to tell us to do them and then they're like okay well then we'll do it yeah. Actually, in the end, after War and Waste won, they actually went ahead and did it themselves because they kind of realized, I think, because the community were pressuring them, they went, actually, we can probably, there's enough people in the community that want this change to happen that we can probably do it without saying the government's forced us to do it, which I thought was quite an interesting example of a, a different kind of power dynamic happening there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, look, it's it, it's a difficult one. I think the, the tax incentives for donating food is a real no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And France has also gone down the avenue of saying, you know, supermarkets can't dispose of food, which means yeah. they have to link up with chat food charities and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on the results of that. I've seen kind of differing yeah. analysis. Yeah. But, you know, it, it is at least an attempt at a policy level to try and stop this kind of food waste happening. Sure, sure. Um, and final question uh, very quickly, because we have to move over to audience questions. What can each of us do to help change the waste crisis in this country? Good question. I mean, I think obviously do the things you can yourself to avoid the waste and to deal with it. You know, we've talked about that enough. I think keeping up pressure on decision makers, mm -hmm. keeping pressure up on businesses and governments and councils and that kind of thing. They, you know, they are actually responsive to it. Like when, you know, when councils get everyone calling and going, why don't we have food recycling? It does start to lead to help that process when businesses get, you know, has sort of, you know, when they kind of, they're, bananas wrapped in 12 layers of plastic get put online i think it does help pressure them to go the other way and i think government particularly as i said there's kind of there is momentum there is the con the right conversations are going on about circular economy and about reducing waste and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but that you know your environment minister is always going to end up in a room with the finance minister and you know you need to have that pressure there that you get from the public to make sure that that momentum is continued so mm -hmm. Um, you know, the the good for the hood bunch have put together a toolkit. I think you can you can look look at online a war and waste toolkit, which has some suggestions of what you can do, but also yeah. about engaging with decision makers and emailing your decision makers and stuff like that. So have a look mm -hmm. at that. But you know, I think we have the I think we have the link to the war and waste toolkit. So if you're if you're googling it, please Google war and waste toolkit 2023 because when when it, whenever you put war and waste toolkit, it brings up the one from 2018, which might not be as relevant. It's less tools. It's got less, less tools. tools. It's not as yeah. good a toolkit. I remember you worked really hard in putting that together. So yeah, we want the 2023 one um, that people use. So, uh, Lilia, oh, a lot of questions there. That's just going to be interesting. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to access the questions here, Lilia. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Where do we start? Wow. Okay, so knowing there's a significant amount of nuance with each waste stream, what's one thing or a few things that we can all do? I just sort of asked this question that will have the biggest impact in turning impact in turning. Can I answer that one? Let's go to some yeah. Let's go to something else. Okay, so somebody um, asked. I somebody is asking that. Uh, over the years, they've worked in one particular industry, and they want to shift to more of, of an environmental space. And they want to know if there's any certifications or that they can do uh, to to work more in the fashion management, sorry, the waste management sort of space. Sure there is. I don't know. I don't work in that area. Look up your legal tape. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so another question. Okay. What measures, both carrot and stick, should the state and federal governments take to truly address the problems of textile waste and microplastic solution pollution from clothing? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Let's firstly, I guess we kind of touched on the textile wasting already. 
you need to somehow change the market at the moment. You need to kind of have some kind of, um, you need to have some kind of disincentive to continue to go faster and faster fashion. So that needs to be some kind of price scenario that actually comes in there. When it comes to the microplastics, it's a difficult one because, and it's interesting because again, an enormous amount of our PET in the world is actually not recycled back into a bottle. It's recycled into clothing. So yeah. people say, is that, we shouldn't be doing that. Now, exactly. a, a PET bottle that's recycled into clothing is better than a virgin piece of PET clothing. So mm. it's kind of positive on that front, but it doesn't solve the second problem, which is the microplastics problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I've spoken to a lot of people about this. I know there's some, there's some experiments going on at the moment at UNSW with enormous amounts of washing machines trying to figure out if you can have filter systems that try and filter out that stuff. We're talking extremely small pieces of plastic and to have a filter system that can work in your average kind of home is difficult at the moment. So we don't necessarily have that solution at the moment. So it's one of those areas that I kind of bang my head against the wall and don't have the good answer for anyone yet. There's a lot of work going into it. <laughs> Um, so you can, um, it seems everyone expects you to have all the questions, you know, you are Mr. Eco Warrior in Australia. So it's like, if you don't have all the questions, if you don't have the answers, Craig, who's going to have all the answers? I have the answer. Well, here's a good one, actually, from Frank Eakin. Yeah. Should there be an obligation on, this, on the part of solar panel importers to ensure recycling of solar panels? And yes, there should. So that's another perfect example of where um, product stewardship should come in. So that when you buy a product, part of the fee that you pay for the product should be to ensure that at the end of its life, it gets recycled. Now in Australia at the moment, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. We don't have, we don't have a great recycling system at the moment. We're kind of a little bit behind. There's some interesting investments going into it. Victoria has banned the landfilling of solar panels, but yeah, overall, we're kind of moving in that direction. But, and this is one of the things I think is fascinating. Sometimes people tend to use the, oh, but hang on a second, we're not dealing with the waste of solar panel to try and argue that we shouldn't be going to solar panels. It kind of becomes this, you know, online, oh, solar panels are really bad for the environment, right? So yeah. let me first put that in context, right? So right now we have 6,000 tons, or 2018, we had 6,000 tons of solar panel waste. Yeah. By 2035, they're saying it'll go to 100,000 tons, okay? 100,000 tons of solar waste. That's a lot, right? Yeah. Right now, our coal ash waste, so the, the waste we get from burning coal yeah. is 12.5 million tons a year. Whoa. 12.5 million tons. So, you, like, if you, I've tried to graph this, and you can't graph it because you can't see the solar panel waste next to the coal <laughs> ash waste yeah so if anyone ever kind of uses the if anyone ever tries to use the solar panel waste as an argument to say we shouldn't use solar panels mm -hmm. that's rubbish even if on a life cycle if compared to kind of using coal to using solar panels for 25 years whatever they last for and then putting it into landfill it's still well and truly ahead that yeah. doesn't mean we shouldn't be improving our way we recycle solar panels because they've got great they've got lots of great resources in them but uh, it's definitely not an exact not it's not an argument against using solar Okay. Okay. I'll let you choose the next question. The well, I'm just trying to say there's so many here. There's so many. I don't even know where to go because some of them, you've sort of half answered them. Some of them are just comments. Is it time for Australia to introduce a tax for the use of virgin plastics? The UK is, is heading the way, which means that there is an uptake in the recycled plastics industries. And that's from Nicole Fidge. A really good question. <clears throat> um, yeah. I, uh, it seems to be quite early at the moment, the kind of plastic tax in the UK, but whether it's a plastic tax or anything else, we fundamentally need to change the economics of recycling yeah. at the moment. So, so many, I talk to people all the time who say, I desperately want to make my products out of recycled plastics and I can't get them, or they're too expensive, or they're massively more expensive than virgin products. And as long as we've got these virgin products being much cheaper, we're going to continue to use them. So that's, we fundamentally have to change that. There has to be some kind of penalty. So if you use virgin plastic, you pay an extra amount and then that gets invested in the infrastructure or creating the market for the recycled product. Because as I said, 13% recycling rate for plastic at the moment, yeah. fundamentally not good enough. Absolutely yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely product stewardship seems to be the way to go, mm. um, you know, for a lot of these solutions. Um, so I, Somebody asked this question previously about the, you know, in the, in the episode with the pharmaceuticals, the um, blister packs that yes. you so uh, generously 
gifted back to the pharmaceutical <laughs> companies. Um, so how far have, have they gone further with than just uh, it's discussion? You say that. Um, so look, they've gone together and kind of a group of them have started talking about it, mm -hmm. but it's exceedingly slow. And yeah. what they tend to do is they say that these massive global companies literally making billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And they tend to say, oh, we're looking at new packaging solutions for the future. And I say, great, do yeah. that. But yeah. while you're doing that, why don't you recycle your current packaging? You know, you can, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can do both of those things. Yeah. So, like, and they've been so slow to actually come forward. So the actual massive amount of um, blister packs that we, that we picked up, and took we you know, we found an actual place that can recycle them. We're going to actually have to end up doing a GoFundMe to get those recycling. We're actually about to start that now. Yeah, because pharmaceutical companies won't even stump up the cash for that tiny amount for like one or so tons that we actually picked up and took to that company. So, it yeah, it doesn't beg it. And that's and that's why look, in the end, having that pressure from government. I know government's been talking to pharmaceutical companies about product stewardship. Having that pressure from government is essential, but in Australia, that pressure sends, tends to dissipate uh, because, you know, lobbying companies are very powerful. Our government's kind of weak about putting something in place. Watch Democracy for Sale. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah. That's the problem is that we have these great conversations and everyone goes, oh, this is great. And then it kind of dissipates a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's a question. The National Plastic Plan 2021 details problematic plastics and the need to remove them. Would synthetic turf be seen as a problematic plastic? I'm not sure if it's, it's, it's officially done, but yes, yeah, synthetic turf is a, is definitely a problem. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it creates, definitely creates a microplastic problem and synthetic turf should be avoided as much. It's, it's interesting as well where some of the, uh, the example we gave of like, sugarcane bag ass products having PFAS in them. It's an example where unfortunately this supposedly fantastic solution for recycling, which is taking, you know, a food waste product and turning it to packaging, unfortunately has this side effect. And that's where government needs to step in and go, look, again, it's not up to us to regulate PFAS content for God's sake. Mm. I can't do that and sit at home with my little olive oil tester and trying to figure it out. No, drives me insane that we have a government that doesn't put in place actual rules. It's known about PFAS in these products for years now and has had a voluntary phase out. Mm. It just drives me absolutely insane. So yeah, look, things like also putting rubber into kind of, if you put rubber into playgrounds and that kind of yeah. stuff, you've got your, your synthetic grasses. There's always my concern is that that then gets back into the environment. So yeah. you have to kind of find those recycling solutions and ensure that that product doesn't end up getting back into the environment in the, in the, in the long term. Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, you just mentioned PFAS. And what's interesting is we we keep going into this cycle, right? And the thing about, the interesting thing about us, particularly us humans, is that if we have a product or consume something, if we don't die immediately, we think, oh, it's fine. Never mind if it's going to kill you a slow, painful death in five to 10 years because it's carcinogenic or whatever. Now, my question is this. Um, plastic, when it was first invented, and in, I think in the 50, uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, it was it solved a lot of problems, right? And it still does. It's very convenient, right? But we know the downside to it now, right? Um, and there, were, I think, I don't know what, whether it was in the 80s or the 90s, but people were like, "There's, you know, we need to start using paper products in place of plastic because it's better for the environment and then you mentioned earlier the problem of deforestation right um and so we go we go back to plastic because it's better than cutting down all the trees and then back to paper again because you know it's better then we we have toxic chemicals like pfas and so on and it just goes on and on and on and on mm. should there be what what i term a 360 ecology check whenever we're creating pro uh, products or solutions to, you know, no one has a crystal ball, no one can see the future, but should there be some kind of 360 ecology check where we're thinking about, okay, this material that's supposed to be a solution, what's the impact going to be five years down the line, 10 years down the line on this environment or other environments on the other side of the world? You know yeah. what I mean? Or I I, Absolutely. I mean, yeah. whenever we're bringing, this is the same thing we're saying with the PFAS thing is, you know, you expect that your government who has the money and the research and your CSIRO and that 
yeah. when new products are hitting the market, they are doing the proper experiments and looking at the whole life cycle of those things and ensuring that they're healthy and that, you know, they're coming to market in a safe way. That's yeah. not necessarily the case. Yeah. Um, from the checkout to these days, I'm always astounded by, we, we tend to have a kind of put on the market first and we'll check it out later approach to things. So I don't think that's the best approach. One thing I would say with that though, is we have to be cautious of placing an unrealistic expectation on the alternatives. It's like the same as I said with solar panels, right? What we tend to have is this thing where we go, people go, oh, hang on a second, solar panels, you know, there's a bit of a waste problem there. You go, yeah, but they're fundamentally massively better than what, that, what they're replacing. And that's what you're looking for, something that's better. It doesn't have to be perfect. One of the things I find difficult in the environmental space is this expectation of perfection. Yeah. Us living on this planet, we have a footprint. We yeah. fundamentally have a footprint, particularly us living in the Western world. We have a large footprint. Those mm -hmm. of us living in Australia have one of the largest per person carbon footprints in the world. So the question becomes not, what can I do so I have no effect in the world? Mm -hmm. How do I massively reduce that? What's the best thing that I can possibly do? And that's really important. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that thing of talking between paper and plastic that you were giving the example there, right? So when we're looking at getting rid of plastic bags in supermarkets or, you know, what's the approach, what's the best approach for that? Yeah. A lot of people would say, you know, in the old days, we used to have paper bags. Why don't they just shift over to paper bags? Yeah. And my answer to that was, well, if you actually shifted from single use plastic bags, like mm -hmm. whatever it was, 2 billion or whatever we we're using a year, I can't even remember the stat, but, you know, let's say we went from using 2 billion single use plastic bags to yeah. 2 billion single use paper bags. Yeah. That is fundamentally just as bad, if not potentially worse, mm -hmm. you know, it's not as bad on animals choking. It's much worse on a carbon emissions basis. Exactly. So the thing that we actually needed to do was change our behavior. And interestingly enough, putting the 15 cent charge on plastic bags mm -hmm. led to an 80% reduction in single use bags. Yeah. Now, I know you still see them around. I know it's not a perfect solution, Yeah. but there was a recent study suggesting that 80% of people now are taking reusable bags every time they go to the supermarket so yeah. what actually happened was we put in place a financial incentive that changed people's behavior towards reusable things and that's a much better approach so we're yeah. using less things we're using them over and over and over again and that's the, mm -hmm. the approach we need to have so look yeah it's I'm looking for the kind of what's the best what's the best you know thing to use for this single use product probably let's not just have the single use product exactly Precisely that. Now, um, I have another question here. What are B corporations and how do they fit into the circular economy? B corporations are corporations that kind of go through a, a rating system to show that they're kind of doing the best in terms of climate and all that kind of stuff and waste kind of stuff. I mean, it's great to have that incentive there. It's great to have a way to judge the company's behavior. I mean, I think, yeah, if you can become a B Corp company, it's much better. <clears throat> um, pressure on companies even beyond that to kind of do the right thing is really important and particularly i think particularly on i mean it, one of my concerns at the moment is kind of on the you have companies that say are oh, we going to be you know carbon neutral by 2050 yeah and they actually have no plan for that or their plan is based on just buying you know offsets yeah That's fundamentally good enough so you know <laughs> you said you said, you said a tr sense. sorry you said a trigger word people at australia institute hate the word offset i know, I know, they, just, I know. they just lose their marbles here so yeah let's, let's not say that <laughs> okay um so another question is this is about a food one what about use by dates if somebody wants to know are use by dates set by public health agencies or by the stores do you, do you know that? Yeah, so that's it's interesting that because there's some I think in the UK they're moving away from use by dates because mm -hmm. there's or best before dates, particularly right. best before use by tends to suggest, you know, that there's a kind of help a reason to not use it past that. Yeah. Best before dates, however, tend to just be a kind of suggestion. So in the UK, they're moving away from best before dates because they think it leads to a lot of people chucking out food that's totally fine. So the suggestion is you go to a sniff test on milk rather than kind of best before because it might be entirely fine by that point. So I think, yeah, the actual biggest effect of those used by dates and best before dates is actually not on you and I picking it up and throwing it out. Yeah. The actual worst effect is that supermarkets require you, for instance, to have a six month standard for <clears throat> of your used by date. So lots of stuff, again, doesn't get to the shelves of supermarkets because it doesn't have a long enough date on it. And that's a kind of get another one of those unseen waste situations we have.
so yeah the more more we can move away from them except in essential circumstances the better okay okay um here's an interesting question for you craig war and waste has been great as an awareness raiser but the momentum always fades if it isn't maintained so we have a different government um, we have an ABC with at least some security around funding, and the board is in flux. Is it time to pitch a War on Waste checkout mashup show <laughs> that can appear weekly and perhaps catch a red cycle issue as it occurs rather than long after? Look, I, I don't, I, I think that you people tend to overstate the importance of the show, War on Waste. Like mm. that starts the conversation, and, you know, we can inform people to a certain extent. That's not where the change comes from. Change doesn't come from an idiot like me on television. Change actually comes from if, if an idiot like me on television engage, you know, if people get interested in that and then they start getting together with groups in their community, doing, you know, activism on that basis, contacting the local councils, being part of a group that's campaigning for change, putting that pressure there, voting against the, the, the people who are against it, that kind of stuff. And that's where the change actually fundamentally comes from, you know, yeah. trying to make change within the workplace. So, look, uh, yes, it does tail off and we'll try and keep it up as much as we can, but it's it's the community activism that brings the real change, not yeah. the television show. Sure, yeah. sure. That's a good answer. Um, so here's another question. So if to deliver 82% renewable energy by 2030, we need huge amounts of green steel, isn't the only current source of green steel from recycling? And what do you think about recycling more than 50% of vehicles in transport in the transport sector already being the biggest emitters? Um, okay, I'm not sure about exactly on the 50% thing. I mean, yes, steel is, you're right. The, the most green steel at the moment is recycled steel. I mean, there's some fascinating work going on, on obviously using green hydrogen to create steel and it has great potential for Australia, hopefully long-term in that front. Uh, but yeah, recycling steel is the most, the green steel at the, mo at the moment. Our recycling rates for metals tend to be much higher than other areas. So, you know, I said plastic was around 13%. Steel, and that tends to be around you know, kind of 70, 80%. So we've got much higher and better recycling rates for that kind of stuff. So obviously we need to get that higher again. Yeah. Because if you're burying, like any bit of steel that we bury is bearing enormous amount of resources, enormous amount of energy. I mean, aluminium particularly, yeah. aluminium uses, I, I'm not allowed to swear on this thing, but a large amount <laughs> of energy to make it so yeah. the more we can recycle those kind of things and things it's interesting like things like um your return and earn your kind of container deposit schemes have increased that kind of recycling rate of those kind of consumer level stuff but yeah, yeah we need to be recycling far more and again we need to have those incentives in place to do that okay um i'm trying to look for one we're running out of time. Just trying to look for something you can answer. One well, quick. There's, there's only 99. There's only more than 100 questions there, Nina. How come you're finding it hard to find one? I well, mean, I want to. I want to. Uh, I want one of those are just from Garnet about um, synthetic <laughs> turf. We've answered that question, Garnet. <laughs> something you can answer in three minutes or less, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So even with the high cost of living currently, people are still following the capital model of buying more, buying more clothes, buying Uber Eats. How do we encourage people to move away from this model when the world is encouraging us to spend, 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 even if high cost of living isn't enough? So if you can answer this in like two minutes, that yeah. would be amazing. <laughs> Look, fundamentally, that is it's true. Like we we have a our economy is built on churning through stuff. Um, I don't want to say, you know, if you can make things using renewable energy and otherwise it it fundamentally changes the dynamics of the things we're purchasing and buying. But in the end, the better thing is to buy less. Like yeah. the kind of environmental question, the answer to any environmental question is buy less of it and use it for longer generally. So, you know, yeah. it may be slightly different in terms of vehicles sometimes. Yeah. But really difficult to change that model. And it's interesting when we talk about fashion, Nina, because you go online, there's really exciting things. There's sustainable fashion hashtags. There's, you know, visible mending hashtags and that kind of thing. You look at the amount of people following those kind of things. And then you look at the major fashion brands in the world and how many people follow them. And yeah. it's just it's totally out of whack. So yeah. I, I don't have the necessary answer to that, but we need to change those underlying economic models so that we can actually it's uh, almost it's almost as if we need to change the economic models 
I mean, yeah. it, if it's almost like if our econo- our economies are built on the growth of the economy is built on extracting materials from the earth, raw materials from the earth, in order to create products, in order to create mm. jobs, whatever, to grow the economy, then that that model is just going to continue. I don't know. But I don't think, I think we shouldn't equate. I think we should be careful of equating, you know, jobs just with the negative approach. You can yeah. have sustainable, more sustainable growth. I and think. The change think, we actually have to fundamentally have. I yeah. mean, you can, you know, if somebody doesn't spend money on a cheap as shit $7 plastic piece of jeans from China, it yeah. doesn't bring the world economy to a knees. It can be spent elsewhere. Let's yeah. not, you know, let's not how think. About, how about, about we have jobs that actually fix the planet? More jobs. Exactly. I mean, if, if, if somebody if somebody was to repair the current jeans the person is wearing, it also gives exactly. jobs. Exactly. Okay. That's so a no-brainer. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. But I don't think, we, yeah, we shouldn't equate the thing that, you know, that, Oh, well, if we're unsustainable, we need to be unsustainable because of jobs. That's not necessarily the truth. I think we that need to change that. That is not the truth here. at all. Um, I think we have some economists here that would, would tell you that. Okay, so we are almost out of time. And Craig, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. It's been, as always, you've been amazing. And, you know, we can go on for probably hours listening to yeah, you. Yeah, I, I apologize to the, uh, you know, 100, oh my God. I apologize to the 160 people we didn't get to answer the question today. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We're sorry we couldn't we couldn't answer all your questions, but we hope that you found this webinar session incredibly useful and helpful nonetheless. Um, If you want to know how you can take action in your communities, in your um, in your homes, please Google War on Waste Toolkit 2000. Sorry, 2023. Um, and follow the information there. Thanks again, Craig, for being with us and sharing this knowledge and your phenomenal work. War on Waste is on ABC and iView. Check it out if you haven't already seen it. Even if you have seen it, it's worth watching again and again and again and again. (laughs) Thanks again, Craig. Thanks very much, Dana. This was the Australia Institute War on Waste webinar for the Circular Economy Program. And check out our website for upcoming war on, sorry, upcoming webinars. Next Uh, Tomorrow at 11 a.m., we have a webinar with Wayne Swan, former Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer, and that will be in conversation with our Chief Economist, Dr. Greg Jericho. So thank you very much, and bye, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified when we publish a new one. See you next time.